Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. The causeway to the Khafre Pyramid, the second major pyramid to be built on the Giza Plateau, was constructed on a ridge of limestone, a narrow band of bedrock that, surprisingly, is one of the most interesting, most important and also most dividing subjects to research when it comes to the history and development of the Giza Plateau. It runs for around 495 metres from the northwestern corner of the Khafre Valley Temple, past the Great Sphinx and ends at the Khafre Mortuary Temple in the west. It has quarries on both its northern and southern sides, meaning that this strip of bedrock was left intentionally. And although Egyptologists will state it's all part of Khafre's pyramid plan, the truth may not be quite so straightforward. In fact, this ancient roadway could well be the oldest feature used by people on the Giza Plateau, older than both the Pyramids and the Great Sphinx. It looks like the Giza Plateau developed around this narrow strip of bedrock, that it was always a central feature, with origins going back to either pre-dynastic or early dynastic times. And, in this video, I'll be going through the evidence in a logical and step-by-step -step manner for you to evaluate. We first turn our attention to the quarries either side of the causeway, to try and understand when they were first being exploited for stone, and the associated implications for the development of Giza. It's generally accepted by Egyptologists that the quarry to the south of the causeway was the work of Khufu the builder of the Great Pyramid, the first major pyramid of Giza. Detailed information on this quarry can be found in Mark Lehner's 1985 study titled The Development of the Giza Necropolis, the Khufu Project, which I've linked below in the description. The quarry's association with Khufu is not debated, and in Mark Lehner's 1997 book, The Complete Pyramids, he shows this fantastic annotated diagram labelling the South Quarry as the Khufu Quarry. But on the same diagram, Lehner labels the quarry north of the causeway, Khafre's Quarry. But interestingly, as you can see he adds a question mark. This quarry begins around 20 metres behind the Sphinx enclosure, and the reason for the question mark is that there is a body of thought that this too was started by Khufu. This is because two ancient parallel stone walls were found north of the modern paved road and south of Khufu's eastern cemetery. These walls were built into the northern part of this northern quarry. The foundations of the walls run along the floor of the quarry, leading into Khufu's eastern Mastaba field, and Khufu mud seal impressions were found in the debris between the walls. Mark Lehner believed the parallel walls could have been part of an ancient supply ramp or roadway, as the walls slope up towards the eastern Khufu cemetery. Writing about this part of the northern quarry in 1985, Lena wrote, and I quote, This quarry is construed as supplying stone for the construction of the Eastern Cemetery. End quote. Therefore, because they were built onto the floor of the quarry, it is a fair assumption that this section of the northern quarry was the work of Khufu. The discovery led to this diagram being published, showing the northern quarry in two halves. The eastern half was the work of Khufu, and the western half was created during the reign of Khafre. Lena writes, quote, The eastern half of this quarry could have been begun under Khufu, just behind the Sphinx which was made later. End quote. This diagram, labelled B3 in Lehner's 1985 paper, although somewhat inaccurate in the placement of the Pyramids and the Sphinx, has a section labelled B9, which contains the parallel walls, and in his opinion, this was the Khufu part of the quarry, whilst B24 was the part quarried by Khafre. The fact we find Khufu archaeology, however limited in the northern quarry, is significant, 
because if Khufu was responsible for quarrying on both the northern and southern sides of the Khafre Causeway, it means that this narrow stretch of bedrock was intentionally left by Khufu, that it was there long before Khafre even started planning his funerary complex. The brilliant French architect Jean-Pierre Houdin explains the need for Khufu to keep the narrow stretch of bedrock as it connects the man-made harbour in the east to the high ground in the west. By not removing it, Khufu would have a natural low gradient ramp to transport the large granite blocks used in the Great Pyramid from the harbour to the higher elevations of the plateau. Houdan believes that from this high ground, which today is home to the Khafre Pyramid, Khufu constructed another ramp to the upper part of the Great Pyramid, making the transportation of the enormous granite blocks as efficient and easy as possible. Khufu's architects were intelligent, harnessing the land's natural slope and then quarrying either side of it. As well as being used for the transportation of granite, the ramp could also be used to transport the quarried limestone blocks. This is a perfectly logical and realistic explanation as to why Khufu would keep the strip of bedrock intact, and it would also make sense that Khafre reused this feature for his own pyramid causeway. As well as Houdan's hypothesis, Others have offered a suggestion as to why the long ridge of bedrock was kept. For one, it could well have been an older roadway, maybe used in pre-dynastic or early dynastic times, so it made sense to protect and make use of a pre-existing feature of the landscape. Secondly, the Great Pyramid architects could have pre-planned the Giza Plateau for Khufu's successors, that there was always a master plan for more than one pyramid at Giza. Maybe they quarried the plateau with the mindset that this would be a 4th dynasty royal family plot. Due to Khafre's pyramid being built on higher ground compared to the Great Pyramid, it means the two main Giza pyramids do look to have a similar height. And from a certain location, we can see the sunset between the two, forming what looks like a giant Akhet symbol, as observed by Mark Lehner. In his 1985 paper, Giza, a contextual approach to the pyramids, he says, quote, Another dramatic effect is created at sunset during the summer solstice as viewed again from the eastern niche of the Sphinx Temple. At this time, from this vantage, the sun sets almost exactly midway between the Khufu and Khafre pyramids, thus construing the image of the Akhet horizon hieroglyph on a scale of acres. He continues, The effect is again best seen from the top of the Sphinx Temple colonnade, or an equivalent height to the east of the temple where the sand rises. At this height, the Sphinx is merged into the silhouette of the Khafre Pyramid. End quote. We know that the ancient name for the Great Pyramid was Akhet Khufu, a name that would be later used for the Giza Plateau as a whole, and so the solar alignment may not be a mere coincidence, and that there was always a master plan. Interestingly, as noted by Keith Hamilton in his publication, Khafre's Temples Part 2, The Sphinx Enclosure and Causeway, he notes that the angle of the causeway appears to mirror the initial stretch of Khufu's causeway, which is about 14 degrees north of due east, whilst Khafre's causeway is about 14 degrees south of due east. He says, quote, It has been suggested that the causeways could denote the midpoint of the sun's journey between the equinoxes and midsummer. End quote. During the construction of Khafre's pyramid complex, the ridge of rock was of course built upon, with a covered stone causeway constructed on top and running down the centre, with a path or walkway running either side of it. The northern walkway can be seen today with a fractured yet flat sub-horizontal surface. Where bedrock was lacking or defective, it appears that during the reign of Khafre, blocks of stone were inserted. These walkways were about 4 to 5 metres in width and looked to be a little lower than the actual covered causeway, as shown on this picture. 
it runs above the Sphinx enclosure's southern wall, and here it is quite well preserved, and in stark contrast to the heavily eroded Sphinx enclosure southern wall. Therefore, we have to consider why, because the narrative taught by Egyptology is that the Sphinx enclosure walls and the causeway were created together, as part of the Khafre Pyramid project. The natural fissures that run through the limestone bedrock are very well exposed on the Sphinx enclosure's southern wall. These natural tectonic cracks have been a feature of the limestone bedrock for literally millions of years, and have been attacked by weathering processes long before human history even began, before humans had even evolved. For reference, weathering involves processes that attack the actual rock, its fundamental makeup, and cause it to break down. A rock does not have to be exposed for it to be weathered. On the other hand, erosion is the process or processes that actually remove the rock, removing boulders, crystals, grains and so on from the bedrock. In terms of the weathering of the Sphinx enclosure limestone, we know for a fact that two processes have been at work. Millions of years ago, before the harder limestone that formed the head of the Sphinx was even deposited, geologists know that ancient acidic water began dissolving the softer member 2 limestone that we see on the Sphinx body and Sphinx enclosure walls. The Sphinx limestone has been further weathered by acidic groundwater, which dissolved limestone along natural fractures, again processes that would have taken place for millions of years, as groundwater levels went up and down, as Nile floods went up and down, and as northern Africa oscillated between wet and dry conditions. This is explained on David Miano's World of Antiquity YouTube channel in conversation with geologist Rob Schneiker. So, before the first people arrived at Giza, the limestone in this region was always in a bad state, long before any quarrying began. It was heavily fractured by tectonic forces, and heavily weathered from acidic groundwater. This breakdown of the rock's fundamental makeup is the reason you can remove flakes of it by hand today. It's brittle and very soft. When the Sphinx enclosure was cut, we can assume that the walls were cut straight, likely inclined and not vertical, as shown here on these profile diagrams. So, looking at the form of the enclosure walls today, they have clearly been not just weathered but eroded, and nobody can put the erosion down to one specific process. There is wind erosion at Giza, wind that whips up the sand and blasts limestone exposures. It also rains at Giza, even today. No, not regularly, but when it does it will be another erosion process. Rainstorms can often be short and intense, and this causes rainwater that can't percolate through the pores of the limestone to flow across the plateau in a southeasterly direction. Therefore, the Sphinx enclosure can also be attacked by rainwater runoff. Also, the groundwater continues to be wicked up and it evaporates at the surface. As it does so, salt accumulates in the pores of the limestone and the rock exfoliates. This process, like rainfall and rainwater runoff, can give rock exposures a more rounded appearance. The groundwater that is wicked up follows the natural bedrock fractures, and so compared to the other parts of the limestone, the fractures are attacked more, giving them a more rounded appearance. Therefore, this means the closer the bedrock is to the water table, the more weathering and erosion from groundwater wicking should be taking place at the Sphinx, and the water table is just 15 meters below the surface. Dr. K. L. Gorey explains the degradation of the Sphinx enclosure from a similar process. This involves the dew that forms at night on the exposed limestone, removing soluble salts from the surface of the rock. Capillary forces draw this solution into the pores of the limestone matrix, where further salts are dissolved. As daytime temperatures rise, the solution begins to evaporate, precipitating salt crystals within the confined neck of the pores, 
The pressure that the crystals exert as they grow leads to flaking of thin rock layers from the surface of the limestone. So, understanding the weathering and erosion of the Sphinx enclosure is not simple by any means. There are a series of complex processes to consider, but it's the processes I've just mentioned that help us to understand the early development of Giza. It's the key part of the puzzle. Details matter, and when studying the Sphinx enclosure, nobody can deny there is a clear asymmetrical erosion profile on the walls. They are far more degraded towards the western end compared to the east. Look at the soft member 2 limestone of the western enclosure wall and the western end of the southern enclosure wall. Then compare the degradation to the same member 2 limestone at the eastern end of the southern enclosure wall. The weaker beds as well as the natural fissures have been eroded out by salt exfoliation, there is no denying that, but that would not form a clear and obvious asymmetrical erosion profile. That process alone does not explain why the western end is far more degraded than the east. The bedrock at the western end is very rounded, with a hummocky or coved appearance, caused by the natural fissures and limestone beds being eroded out. But at the eastern end of the southern wall, the degradation is far less pronounced. For example, the fissures look more angular and sharper. Some say the bulk of the erosion at the Sphinx enclosure is caused by groundwater wicking and salt exfoliation. But if so, shouldn't we see the opposite trend? Because the southeastern end of the enclosure is closer to the water table, i.e., closer to groundwater, because the Giza Plateau slopes to the southeast. The southern enclosure wall is one wall, one phase that is cut as part of one project. But to have such a drastic change in appearance from east to west, it surely says that another process on top of salt exfoliation has caused the degradation we see. Taking everything into account, the dominant process to form the asymmetry must surely be rainfall runoff. The Giza necropolis sits on a gently sloping limestone plateau. With limited vegetation and subsoil cover, sporadic heavy rainfall would have quickly saturated the fine grained limestones on the Giza surface. Any excess water would have travelled downslope as runoff. Giza had an extensive catchment, and the runoff would have produced surface flows that were capable of significant erosion. And this is not bordering on the realms of pseudoscience because we know for a fact that flash floods and rainfall runoff did destroy the original Menkore Valley Temple, and this took place in the Old Kingdom. The idea is not controversial, it has taken place at Giza. As shown by Colin Reader in his publication, Giza Before the Fourth Dynasty, within the Sphinx enclosure itself, there is further unquestionable evidence of erosion from running water as we can see a shallow erosion channel on the enclosure floor. It emanates from the large main fissure of the Sphinx enclosure at the point it's exposed on the southern enclosure wall. As we can see, this channel runs towards the Sphinx temple. Colin Reader applied the concept of a flow net to the Sphinx enclosure to show how topography influences surface water or groundwater. The spacing of the flow line shown in blue indicates the relative intensity of the resulting flow. The diagram backs up the claim that the Sphinx enclosure would have felt the full force of rainwater runoff and it predicts the greatest erosion would take place at the western end. Furthermore, it predicts the western end of the southern wall should be worse affected when compared to the east, and this is what we see in the field. But now it gets more interesting, because the flow net does not take into account the quarrying at Giza, with the northern quarry located just 20 metres to the west and upslope from the Sphinx. The flow net is showing what would happen if there was no quarry, just the original Giza topography. Once quarrying began, 
the flow net would have been disrupted, with runoff being discharged into the quarry basin, and the vast majority of groundwater runoff would never actually reach the Sphinx enclosure. In 1843, Carl Epsius witnessed a brief but severe rainstorm at Giza, and a torrent of water washed over the plateau. Tents were washed away, and even objects as heavy as crowbars. He notes that the water formed a lake inside a hollow behind the Sphinx, and he states that this lake had no outlets, indicating it did not discharge into the Sphinx enclosure. It is believed that this lake-forming hollow was inside the sand and debris-filled northern quarry, which was saturated and filled with water between the pores of the infill, again showing that Reader's topographical assessment is correct, that quarrying did directly affect surface hydrology, greatly reducing the quantity of rainfall runoff that could reach the Sphinx enclosure. I would just like to plug Colin Reader's brand new book titled A Gift of Geology, Ancient Egyptian Landscapes and Monuments, available now on Kindle and in paperback. This really is a fantastic book and I've left links in the description below. As stated, the flow net predicts the western end of the southern wall would be worse affected than the eastern end, and beyond the main fracture in the southern wall, the degradation of the limestone is greatly reduced. That likely indicates that whatever runoff was coming towards the eastern half of the southern wall went down the large natural fissure and then into the Sphinx enclosure, causing the channel we see on the floor. So, the east to southeastern slope of the topography, together with the orientation of the Sphinx enclosure, meant that before the Giza Plateau was quarried, rainwater runoff perfectly explains the asymmetrical erosion we see in the Sphinx enclosure. But according to geologist Rob Schneiker, if there is substantial runoff erosion in the Sphinx enclosure, we should also see a plunge pool i.e. erosion on the enclosure floor at the foot of the western wall, and also at the foot of the western end of the southern wall. But we don't see it. But this can be explained, because at the foot of the eroded western wall and the western end of the southern wall, we have a large step of harder Member 1 limestone. This rock type is in better condition, it is harder to erode, and so it's not unusual we don't find a plunge pool. Although you could argue that the Member 1 rock does look to be quite degraded, and this could be from a number of processes including running water. As you walk from west to east along the base of the southern enclosure wall, as soon as the rock type underfoot changes from the harder Member 1 to the softer Member 2, we do see a great deal of ground erosion clear evidence that water has flowed into the enclosure and off to the east. If we follow the evidence, the most logical interpretation for the well-eroded western end of the enclosure can realistically only be explained if the Sphinx enclosure was created before the quarry to the west, which is the quarry located north of the Caffrey Causeway I discussed earlier. Therefore, the age of the creation of this quarry is now even more important, because if it was started by Khufu, as the evidence seems to imply, it means the Sphinx enclosure is likely pre-Khufu. But even if the quarry was started by Khafre, it implies the Sphinx enclosure is pre-Khafre. Either way, it certainly seems the Sphinx enclosure does predate its accepted origins. Even if the quarry dating evidence presented by Lehner in his 1985 paper is dismissed, and it turns out quarrying to the west of the Sphinx enclosure did begin during the reign of Khafre, this does not significantly alter Colin Reader's conclusion that the Great Sphinx does predate the Fourth Dynasty. This is because the available data suggests that rainfall in Egypt was experienced only infrequently in dynastic history, occurring at Giza in the Old Kingdom perhaps only a couple of times each century, 
even if the Great Sphinx was dug out at the very beginning of Khafre's reign, and for example, the adjacent quarrying took place at the end of his reign, this would give a limited period of less than 30 years to create the runoff erosion we see, which really is not enough. Even if the Sphinx was created by Khufu, and the adjacent quarry by Khafre, again, we still don't have enough time to explain the level of degradation. The erosion on the Sphinx enclosure would not be this asymmetrical. As soon as this quarry was dug, the surface hydrology would have been disrupted. Open excavation would have intercepted runoff from the higher plateau in the west, and prevented high energy runoff into the Sphinx enclosure. Yes, modern rainfall can still generate runoff into the enclosure, as experienced in 2010, but ever since the quarrying in the 4th dynasty, runoff into the Sphinx enclosure would have been minimal, and also low energy, with water only coming from the immediate land surrounding it. For example, as you may or may not know, there are a number of 26th dynasty tombs that are cut into the western enclosure wall, and although these are more than 2,500 years old, even today you can still see chisel marks at their entrances, and these are cut into the soft member 2 bedrock. So, for 2,500 years, salt growth from evaporated dew and groundwater wicking has not removed this fine detail. Neither has wind erosion, and neither has low energy rainfall runoff. Colin Reader is a trained professional geologist, and his independent assessment is that the Sphinx enclosure was created sometime before Khufu's quarrying began, likely a few hundred years. So, you may be thinking I've gone off track, but this all does relate back to the subject of this video the Cafre Causeway. As noted by G. van der Kroes in 2006, there is an absence of deep gullying on the walkway to the north of the built Caffrey Causeway. Such gullying is something you would expect to find if the western end of the southern enclosure wall was subject to high energy intense rainfall runoff. The subhorizontal surface should be deeply eroded, but it's not. But this is actually yet more evidence the Sphinx enclosure predates the reign of Khafre. The reason for the absence of deep gullying in the top surface is simply because it has been recut. As shown by Colin Reader, the base of the masonry and restoration that marks the northern limit of the Khafre Causeway rises and falls over the remains of gullies and intervening ridges. We don't see this coved appearance on the flanking walkway though, and that's because the rock has been cut down. From what we can see under the masonry causeway though, there does look to be a considerable erosion surface. Of course we can never know when the recutting took place, but it's fair and safe to assume it was done by Khafre, as Egyptologists also believe, as part of the project to turn the long strip of land into a ceremonial causeway for the king's funeral. So, with all the information presented in this video, it implies the Sphinx enclosure was created before the Khufu quarry directly to the west of it, and if so, that means the Sphinx enclosure was most likely created before the pyramids, and this now has implications for the ridge of land the Khafre Causeway was built on. If we look at the orientation of the southern wall of the Sphinx enclosure, we can see it does have an oblique angle, that it wasn't cut straight on an east-west axis. This does seem strange, and the only logical explanation is that this ridge of bedrock used to construct the Khafre Causeway was a road or walkway before not just the pyramids, but also the Sphinx enclosure. The people that created the Sphinx enclosure clearly quarried up to it. Khafre exploited it for his causeway, Khufu respected it when digging his pyramid quarries, and the evidence suggests that this is a pre-4th dynasty feature of the plateau, and due to the oblique southern wall of the Sphinx enclosure, I would argue it was even there before the Sphinx was as well. In this video I'm not focusing on the Sphinx monument itself. The age of the monument we see in the centre of the enclosure cannot be determined by just looking at it, 
because we don't know its full history. It could have been carved in the late pre-dynastic, then re-carved in the early dynastic, then reshaped by Khufu and then by Khafre. It could have been cased in stone, and it could have been repaired with stone a number of times. We don't know if its original form has changed or not. The fissures that run through it have been there for millions of years, attacked by weathering long before a monument was cut, and then it was eroded by wind and rain, by humans exploring it, and by salt exfoliation from dew and groundwater wicking. There are so many processes to consider. You can't get any indication of its age by simply looking at it if we don't know the complete backstory. But by analysing the Sphinx enclosure walls, the 4th dynasty quarries and the ridge of bedrock that was used for the Caffrey Causeway, no geology can't give us absolute dating, but it can give us a relative chronology, and the evidence certainly implies a monument was here of some variety before the pyramids, and that the long road into Giza was a pre-existing feature, possibly leading to a settlement of the pre-dynastic Madi culture, or maybe an early dynastic Sun Temple. Who knows? We'll never see the complete picture, but from the Sphinx enclosure and the Khafre Causeway, to the Chroma Dump, the early dynastic tombs and Madi culture pottery, there are clues the Giza Plateau does have a history that goes much further back than the 4th dynasty. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.